Today we're discussing A Midnight Clear from 1992. It is written and directed by Keith Gordon and based on the novel by William Wharton. Set during the Second World War, it is the story of a small squad of US infantrymen that encounter a group of German soldiers wishing to surrender. The film takes place over Christmas and is therefore our Christmas special. And given that this is our 2020 Christmas movie, in keeping with the general tone of 2020, it's, it's a feel-bad Christmas movie as opposed to last year's, which was very much a warm-hearted, sweet <laughs> yeah. movie. I don't know. I mean, this one, it has like Christmas presents, a Christmas tree, snowman. There's kindness, compassion, humanity, all the uh, spirits of the season. I mean, this is the ultimate Christmas movie, no? Okay, I look forward to hearing you elucidate more on that a bit later on. <laughs> now that's how I've finished. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs> what prompted you to choose this? Because this was your choice, very much so. Yeah, yeah, well, it's one of those films, it's been on my list since 1992, and I've never got around to watching it. So, yeah, when we were sort of discussing ideas for a, a Christmas special, I was like, okay, maybe it's time to sit down and watch A Midnight Clear. I had never heard of it, but I looked it up and it was a Keith Gordon movie, and I am always feel warmly towards Keith Gordon, so I was happy to give oh, it a yeah. go. Are you, do you know of Keith Gordon? Is he in your... Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, no. I remember seeing him in Christine when I was a teenager, mm -hmm. and um, uh, what's, he's in... Is it Blowout? Is he in that? Yeah, well, his first what's acting it? job was in Jaws 2, Oh yeah, okay. and he has such vivid memories of it that I think he's actually contributed a commentary to a DVD on it. About, oh, wow. about his experiences okay. on it and maybe even like a 15 minute short film type thing about it and then yeah he was in blowout and he was he had a quite a prominent role in dress to kill as well so, oh yeah, yeah so he was he was on set kind of learning from the masters and then christine obviously as, as yeah, and... Ar artie cunningham in 1985 he co-wrote and starred in static which was mark romanek's first feature Oh really? Yeah, everyone everyone thinks or everyone thought that One Hour Photo was his was his debut, the one with Robin yeah, Williams yeah, yeah. about fifteen years later. But no, he actually made this very, very quirky eighties indie movie called Static, which I remember quite clearly. I saw it on T V God, when I was at university, it must have been ninety one or ninety two. And then literally a few days later an ex rental copy turned up in the in the video shop, so I picked it up. Oh, cool. It's really interesting. It's very much of its time. It's definitely like a music video director's first movie. There's a lot of yeah, cool. a lot of it's kind of geared to images and ideas rather than story. Oh, perfect! <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right up my street. So from that point on, I was kind of like keeping an eye on him. And I remember um, when Mother Night came out in the sort of mid to late '90s. I went to see that, and it was either in the middle of my Kurt Vonnegut phase, or it might even have kicked off me reading Kurt Vonnegut. Because within a couple of years of seeing that, I'd read all you know, all of Vonnegut's novels up until sort of the late '70s. Oh yeah, and I think a couple of years later, I. I met and sort of worked with an actor who'd who'd just been in one of his films and she had nothing but kind words to say about him All right, so i've well. always kind of liked him and liked him as a presence um and yeah he seems to have i think he's done three or four features and now he's moved into a very solid career doing good episodes of, of good television yeah i mean i listened to the uh the commentary on a midnight clear and he was talking about trying to get onto um you know, they were using A Midnight Clear as a reference for both Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers. I think they used the script to audition actors for Saving Private Ryan. All right. And Ethan, yeah, Ethan Hawke was saying that he was desperate to get on it, but they they just wouldn't look at him because he'd been in this. And <laughs> they, they, they wanted kind of fresh uh, or they didn't want the same association. And I think the same thing happened with Keith Gordon. He was trying to get on to Band of Brothers as a director. Mm. And I think they just wanted a kind of clean, clean slate. Yeah which is bloody annoying because both of them would have been perfect fits for either project. So does this does this movie have like quite a good rep? I mean, I'd, I'd never heard of it until now. Yeah, yeah. I remember it getting like really good reviews when it came out. And I love the kind of poster, this sort of muted grey, black and white image with one soldier dressed in his kind of snow schmuck and him just kind of standing out as this kind of Christ-like figure on this sort of uh, gathering of uh, soldiers. Yeah, I always just thought it looked really amazing, and I can't remember who I saw review it, probably Barry Norman or somebody like that from the time, but yeah, it's always just stuck with me as a film to, to watch. <laughs> I only got around to it a few weeks ago, but yeah, all the kind of, um, I think, Keith Gordon on the commentary was saying that all the reviews that like the really the majors were really kind of solid, you know, praising its kind of anti-war sentiment and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of very early indie movie. So it's sort of fresh technique. But he was saying some of the smaller critics 
kind of blast it for being un-American and unpatriotic and oh, you know all of that kind of jingoistic stuff. So mm. yeah, but I think it has a good kind of solid reputation. I mean, I don't know too much about it other than the sort of principal research I've done for this. It's not a film that I've carried you know, for years. Mm. Shall we start with our first impressions? This is a movie that neither of us had seen before we sat down to do it for the podcast. So, yeah, should we, should we lead with that, first impressions? Yeah, you go first. All right. So, I mean, I watched it twice over two days, and it's one of those movies that, for me, it kind of resonated. You know, I'm, a, I'm an ex-serviceman, um, and I always kind of appreciate more nuanced representations of people in uniform. And I think, like it, it does look like a small indie film, but I came away with this sense that the kind of whole was greater than the sum of its parts. You know, the kind of the point of the film, this anti-war sentiment that runs all the way through it and this kind of urging for compassion and, you know, humanity to to bond and for, for us to find a better way forward. So all of those kind of, you know, quite naive, but ultimately, you know, important sentiments, they resonated much stronger than it's kind of limitations as a an indie movie yeah i think limitations is definitely the key words for me um i i watched it twice although the second time my attention was really really wandering i had a tough second watch trying to trying to make notes on this um mm, okay. i did i did feel that what you were saying was there the the kind of the structure of it and the, and the sentiment which which i think must carry through from the novel it feels like a very sort of steady plan for a really good movie, but there's there's actually not much vitality and not much filling in the movie itself. And I don't want this to be like an, an overwhelmingly negative response from me, but it, I, I didn't enjoy. <laughs> I didn't the, enjoy. It. You're on, yeah, yeah, I didn't enjoy it on many levels, uh, which I guess we can explore kind of bit by bit and I'll, I'll maybe let you lead with your more positive outlook and I'll just kind of <laughs> yeah, trail behind with a few down. Yeah. <laughs> trail behind with a few um unenthusiastic I'm the tree sentences. Of positivity you're the axe of uh, of 2020 <laughs> no it's just I, I I didn't feel anything from it at all oh, really? I felt oh, those are really strong so I thought it was sort of bristling with this kind of you know youthful vigor this idea that you know the when you're younger you believe in positive change and that you know people are better than all the evidence that we're presented with you know people can be better they can make better choices and i thought it had kind of all of those elements all the way through i think the elements are there in the script but i don't think the execution does it i don't think the performances communicate anything at all for me can we talk about the cast because yeah, this, this, I mean, my, my main sticking point for at least the first half of the movie was that I mean, you've got the most early 90s cast in the world here. I know. It's, I thought it was fabulous cast. You've got Peter Berg, Kevin Dillon, Ari Gross, um, Ethan Hawke, very young Ethan Hawke, uh, Gary Sinise, Frank Whaley, and John C. McGinley as Major Griffin. He's just playing kind of the asshole part that he's made a career out of. I think, <laughs> yeah, it, I yeah. think he was just he's kind so of... He's so good at it, just though, putting, right? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's great at it. And he, but he's just putting down roots doing that at this point. You know, he does this, the same character in Point Break. But I, I had a real problem with all of the performances in that they all they were all variations on the same performance for me. There's so much similarity between the performances, apart from maybe, you know, Gary Sinise is a little bit more morose than the rest of them. But they all have the same sort of like open mouthed adolescent enthusiasm, weird, weird innocence in this shitty world line delivery. And the performances just weren't kind of differentiated enough for me to tell the characters apart i mean literally to tell the characters apart when they're in wides and medium shots and the fact that they're all all dressed identically um, and all, have, <laughs> no, all they all have uniform, the same matthew that's what, <laughs> that's what happens when you join the military they, yeah, yeah. they choose your your outfits yeah, for you but as a filmmaker you have to find ways to get past that and i don't think this manages it that well but the performances for me they all have the same sort of slightly open mouth slightly as i say dewy eyed enthusiastic um slightly incoherent panicky I, I i didn't get characters from them it was really really tough for me the first half of the movie um, yeah i mean i know what you're saying you know it, the, the kind of tradition is when you have uh you know a group of servicemen a small group then you you make kind of broad distinctions the crazy one you know the religious one the insular one you know and i think there's something more kind of credible about leveling them out a little bit you know that they are kind of 
peas in a pod. You know, that none of them really want to fight and kill, and you know, none of them want that on their conscience. And I think you know that's a far more authentic portrayal. Yeah, I'm not suggesting. I mean, that's the other end of the seesaw, isn't it? That's that's where you turn them all into different stereotypes. But there's got to be some middle mm. ground. Even, some middle ground. Yeah. Even in the flashback scene where they're kind of on leave and um, trying to find a girl, a girl for them all to sleep with. Again, I couldn't, I couldn't really tell them apart in any way as characters mm, sure. and it was it made it a really tough watch even the second time round and i had to literally you know stop it and make notes as to who who was playing who and who was which character <laughs> um, brown hair blue eyes yeah yeah <laughs> peter berg bee stung lips and aryan bleach blonde hair okay he's he's <laughs> a vacuum, isn't he right okay but in terms of performances i just i, I couldn't tell them apart that well and it, it could just be me but that was that was my main problem with the movie Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, I mean, I I can see what you're saying, but yeah, I didn't. I, for me, that wasn't such a big big issue. Fair. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't mind that there wasn't that much to distinguish between them. You know, they are men in uniform. You know, and you you do have this thing when you when you join up where they shave your head and they take your civilian clothes and you really just walk out of you know the mess hall and everybody looks exactly the same you know there is a kind of strange homogenization that happens as part of your dehumanizing through basic training and i don't know i th I felt by the time these guys are kind of in the combat zone they're starting to find their own personalities again but they are just like teenagers as well you know this there's something really nice about it being cast so young that you know they really don't know who they are at this point you know they're just finding themselves in in the midst of a war i understand that that it it it's probably you know an intentional thing and I, there is a speech about 17 minutes in which suggests that you know this is definitely something that was written into the film there you are intentionally not supposed to tell them apart that easily because they're still undeveloped as men i'm not exactly sure what country we're in it could be belgium luxembourg france or even Germany. I don't know what day it is. I have no watch, so I don't know what time it is. I'm not even sure of my name. The next thing you know, they'll be making me a general. I mean, one of them's a priest, one of them's Jewish, one of them's... Uh, Ethan Hawke. One of them's Ethan Hawke. Are you, are you a fan of Ethan Hawke? Should we digress? I am, generally speaking. I, I like him a lot. I do feel that all of his performances and I've seen him in quite about three or four things in the last month just by chance all of oh, his right, performances okay. are, are, are variations on the persona of Ethan Hawke whatever he's in um, sure. but I like him thank you sound yeah yeah that's it yeah yeah I like that um, I like the Ethan Hawke-ness of Ethan Hawke that was one of my bitterest disappointments I really liked him as did everyone of my age I really liked him in uh, Before Sunrise Oh yeah, um, yeah, fabulous. But I found that when I watched the second movie, I didn't like his character very much in that, and then I didn't get through the third movie because I kind of loathed both of the characters. So oh, it's, like, it's like everyone, including me, has grown up with these people, but I ended up falling out with them. Yeah, yeah, right. Again, that's probably <laughs> well, maybe just me. You'll, uh, you'll meet up again later. What about his more commercial stuff, like Training Day and the Precinct 13 remake and a few of his kind of action forays? He's fine, you know, but again, yeah. he is he is just, he is Ethan Hawke. Yeah, he's, he's solid, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he's really good. Like, he always kind of just seems like he's been electrocuted. I really like that sort of look <laughs> that he has where he sort of just suddenly is flicking around, like his eyes wide, like somebody's just woken him up. I like that. <laughs> Whatever happened to Frank Whaley? I don't know. He was in, in everything. In the commentary, they talk about him doing some directing, but I, I didn't follow it up. Mm. I always had kind of fond memories of Frank Whaley and Kevin Dillon together in The Doors, um, which was, you know, a favourite teenage movie of mine. Mm. He was in everything around 1990 to 94, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I remember Kevin Dillon being in The Blob and um, uh, No Escape with Ray Liotta. I really need to see The Blob again. I wish it would turn up on some sort of rental service. You can get it on blu-ray from america i remember absolutely loathing it i went to see it in the cinema when it came out yeah yeah me too but everyone's been raving about it in the decade since and oh and you know frank darabont's involvement and all that and i can scarcely yeah. remember it i really want to see it again to see if i'm wrong peter berg director peter berg yeah i mean he's a hollywood a-list director now isn't he really solid kind of genre work 
action adventure thriller. And Gary Sinise, who was who was really hot throughout the nineties and seems to have disappeared into TV now. Yeah, well, I think at this point, this is his first film, and I think he was a, a director at the Steppenwolf Theatre, um, so he was doing loads of stage stuff. Mm. This was his debut, yeah, and I remember him. I think that his next film after this, he did he starred and directed it in an adaptation of, of Mice and Men. Did you want to um, talk about any of the performances in particular? I mean, I, you know, I like Ethan Hawke's work in this. You know, I like that he is so young and kind of fresh-faced and I like his sort of reluctant shouldering of responsibility, you know, for the team and trying to make moral decisions instead of military decisions. And I, I think you can see all of that in the performance. I think all of that responsibility is there, you know, and the sort of overwhelming reality of being in a combat zone. I think all of that's that's there, I think, yeah. And I, I love his kind of, you know, it's it's not quite the uh, the arc of come and see, but I do like the, how sort of tired and resigned he is to the reality that he's facing at the end of the film. I found it was a little bit theatrical for me. It wasn't quite as cinematic as it could be. Um, especially considering, you know, Gordon had such a, you know, an excellent filmmaking environment to develop in and to watch whilst he was an actor. Yeah, sure. Um, I did think there was a, a, a tell and show aspect to it, you know, with, with the voiceover, the narration, um, telling you, telling you what the characters were feeling and telling you how the, he was feeling about the situation rather than showing it or sometimes doing both at once telling you whilst it's showing you just a little bit on the nose but i mean you know just jumping in there you know they were a young team of filmmakers you know i think keith gordon was 30 at the time and the actors were ranging from like 20 to 23 24 you know so they they were all young and i think i don't know there is something about you know the the idealism of young people <laughs> and the ambition of just saying everything like just just get it out there and make sure it's not gray you know make sure it is clear what what you're trying to say and yeah you, you, you know just... i agree with what you're saying as well but i can i can imagine quite clearly how that happened and why it happened again just going off um off the commentary track keith gordon was saying that he, you know, he spent a long time talking to William Wharton on the phone about the book. William Wharton, by this point, had kind of up sticks and moved from the States to Paris, where um, William Wharton is actually uh, his pseudonym, and his real name is Albert William Duhaime. Um He's an American, but he lived in Paris as a painter, and he didn't want anyone to know he was a novelist, so he had a pseudonym. He didn't want to be hunted down as the uh, the American in Paris, the the you know, um, celebrated author. Um, but he pretty much told Keith Gordon that the book is fact, you know, it's an autobiography. And, you know, um, I think the book leads with a, a title card that just says the names have been changed to protect the guilty. And it's very much like a, an, about their kind of experiences as being kind of forced to fight and forced to kill. And there's a quote that he says, um, uh, so I'm just like, this is a, a wiki, wiki ripoff, but it says, Wharton was in the infantry and severely wounded in the Battle of the Bulge. His memoirs included an account in, of his role in the killing of German prisoners during the war. And Wharton said, war for me, though brief, had been a soul-shaking trauma. I was scared, miserable, and I lost confidence in human beings, especially myself. And I think after I kind of read that and then watched the film again, I was like, yeah, you can see it, you know, this sort of reluctance to just be in that space when, you, you know, American movies generally, American war movies generally celebrate war and the sort of uh, the necessity of killing and, you know, the fate accompli and, and you know, the actual situation of war is just a given, isn't it? And it's how men yeah, conduct it, themselves in it. That's it, and it, it makes you a man, you know, and yes, you carry the, you know, even Saving Private Ryan, you know, it does glorify the, the war. Yes, that opening section is, you know. 
I completely agree. That opening section is is just like a short film on its own, and the rest of it it comes up with this kind of spurious reason to to glorify battle. Yeah, that's it. And you know, they have. I always remember the Barry Pepper character, the sniper, and you, you know, it's against God's will to to kill people. But there he is, kind of the the crack shot sniper executing people from his uh, bell tower, and then you know, praying for forgiveness, mm. and it still makes it look cool. You know, you do think, oh, I'd love to be a fucking sniper, you know, American sniper. <laughs> you know, that it's like, oh, he's killing all these people, but look at his scorecard. Hasn't he done well? <laughs> you know, there, there aren't many American movies that tackle the subject of men in war that don't inadvertently glorify going to war. I have had a conversation with many filmmakers that talk about Apocalypse Now being one of the main reasons that they wanted to become filmmakers. And for me, I was like, oh, Apocalypse Now is the reason I joined the military. <laughs> I wanted that kind of chaos and, you know, that it just seems like such a free space, you know, like chaos reigns. I was like, that's what I want. And obviously the kind of British Royal Navy is very different to <laughs> the American Army in Viet <laughs> Vietnam. Thankfully, I'm quite happy of that, of that reality now, but... We do have family life now, though. Yeah, that, no, that's chaotic. That's, <laughs> uh, apocalypse now is my reality. I've got two kids. Who's in charge here, man? Ain't you? <laughs> that's, uh, that's the truth. No, that's a very good point, actually. And that is, the, the strength of that is there in the film. It does underpin it. But I, I just think it could, could have been sharper and more, more pointed. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know what you're saying, but for me, it kind of it echoed. So after I'd seen the film, I was thinking about it the next day and, and so on, After even after the second viewing. And it did make me kind of look at my sons and think, don't you ever put on a uniform, you, you little, little bastard. You're never going into that kind of environment because, you know, it is war is essentially a waste of human life, mm. you know, manipulated by people in power that really are just self-serving. And that's that's the reality. And yeah, yeah. I don't think there's any problem that war can solve that can't be solved by any other means. Yeah, sure. You know, chess. It's, it's... <laughs> That's what chess was designed for, was to mm. avert war. Which is, you know, no disrespect to people who serve in the army or, or the armed forces or who do put their lives on the line for something they believe in. Oh, completely. In. Yeah, completely. But I, for me, it's like, I've, I've, it drives me crazy. I get so angry about the waste of that commitment so the governments taking those brave souls and just wasting their lives mm. you know deploying them unnecessarily for economic reasons it's very odd that I mean, we i mean like we're kind of digressing a bit but we have government sponsored militias based on based on feudal principles that go back centuries if not thousands of years why can't we have government sponsored forces that take care of kind of domestic concerns why can't we deal with stuff with the same you know the same vigor why can't we have a, a civil service that's as well funded as the army or, or yeah, the well, army stockpiles i think it was supposed to be wasn't it but then they started privatizing everything and then mm. you know the money gets rinsed and before you know it we're at war again to try and bolster the coffers i think like anti-war movies I mean, I want to say it's a subgenre, but there's so few of them that genuinely are anti-war movies. You know, I think The Thin Red Line is a film that you and I often discuss, and I think that just about walks the line between being an anti-war movie and, you know, it does slightly, not glamorize, but I still think you get that sort of, it whets your appetite for combat. How would I be in that, that situation? So we usually like to talk about um, contributors... Um, cinematography by Tom Richmond. He's kind of a pro. He's been doing indie movies since the mid '80s. I think he did Straight to Hell for Alex Cox. Oh, cool. Um, he's in the pantheon of DOPs who worked for James Gray. James Gray, who only works with the best. Um, yeah, sure. He did Little Odessa. Uh, you've got Slums of Beverly Hills, which was a really good little indie from the late '90s. I think it was with Natasha Leon and Alan Arkin. Yeah, his cinematography looks, I don't know if it's a film stock thing or a transfer thing, but it does look quite early 90s. Just a little bit soft looking. Um, and obviously the, the colour schemes are kind of what they are because of the subject matter. There's a lot of whites and browns and forest greens. 
it's not desaturated but it hasn't got a great deal of sharpness or zing um, and there's a lot of it in firelight in the interiors which tends to flatten things down to orange and brown I found it was really really refreshing when they went outside in the daytime and so you've got crisp snow and blue skies I think it, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a little bit oppressive overall visually editor um, Don Brochu apologies if that pronunciation's wrong he was from this point on pretty much from this movie he took up doing big action films he got oh, really? the, yeah he got the fugitive under siege volcano chain reaction lock up uh, with mystic pizza in there as well somewhere just beforehand oh, yeah. that's good yeah, yeah and then since 2000 he's moved exclusively into tv i wouldn't say there's anything flashy about the editing it's kind of competent and makes it work i, I felt it could be a bit tighter it could be 10 to 15 minutes tighter but that might just be my attention wandering. And... <laughs> yeah, I think then you're in danger of kind of shortening it past, um, you know, feature film length, aren't you? Mm. So. But I did want to flag up the music by Mark Isham, which is one of the worst soundtracks I've ever heard. <laughs> I I, have I was a... wondering where you'd go with that one. <laughs> yeah, it was sort of, a, I, I found it curious, but yeah, I'm that's, sure you uh, that's are, the word. Are, are better able to... I have a, Assassinate it. an odd history of Mark Isham listening. He did one of my favourite tracks of all time, which was the first thing I ever heard of his in the late 80s, uh, called My Wife with Champagne Shoulders, which is like a um, like a short semi-classical piece, but because of the time and the place and who's involved, it's got some lovely sort of ethereal sounds that I think Brian Eno programmed on a dx7 oh, yeah. is it from a film or just a, no, it's, a composer well as a composer he started out as um, a new age composer when new age was deliberately marketed as a brand in the early 80s particularly by um, a label called Wyndham hill who used to do really horrible kind of slightly jazzy cleanly frigidly produced kind of jazz rock ambient -y, easy listening kind of music and mark isham was a uh, uh, one of those guys this is a very weird kind of off the back of Brian Eno doing the ambient series in the late 70s kind of quiet music became a thing but this is very very much marketed and branded and recorded with less artistic intent shall we say than than other artists but he came out of that background and then he did an album called I think it's called Castellana or something in the mid mid 80s which is where that track's from. Um, and I remember taping that track off somebody and then years and years and years and years, possibly decades later, tracking down the album on CD because I wanted to hear the rest of it. And it was oh, yes. it was crap. And he's had this remarkably successful career doing kind of bleary synthesizer soundtracks. And this one, I know it's not that unusual to have an anachronistic electronic soundtrack over a period movie. You know, the Untouchables gets away with it, and uh, yeah, sure. Hoosiers kind of doesn't really get away with it. But there is a precedent. But this one is just kind of, it just sounds like free-floating, arty synthesizer soundtrack music that you could apply to any any indie movie from the period, regardless of genre. And because I listen to a lot of synthesizer music, I can place the instruments and the synthesizers being played from from that era as well. You hear a lot of this stuff, perhaps it reminds me of the stuff that you get on bad indie thrillers that Palace Pictures used to release towards the end of the 80s, early 90s, before they went bust. That sort of heavy synthesizer-y, not really tied into the tone of the film itself, but just of the time. I, I think it's a terrible soundtrack, and it actually, I've, I've got notes here, it, it flattens out a lot of the drama. I mean, I don't expect soundtracks to kind of Mickey Mouse exactly what was going on on screen. But, you know, the, the, there's the thing with the discovery of the two frozen bodies in the road, like the sculpture that's discovered early on. I mean, the music just is devoid of tension and just kills the scene. There's no actual musical sophistication. There's no complexity. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's like low-budget horror For me, that was one music. of those points where I just felt like the music was confusing the scene. Yeah. I, I had less of an idea of what was going on because the music seemed to be telling me something else. Yeah. And, yeah. And this, I mean, for me, it, it, it goes all through the film. Um, it, it, it really goes a long way towards flattening out the drama of the film for me. So maybe if it was rescored, you might have a different... It feels like the, the music is kind of guiding your... Yeah, your I think opinion. my musical has prejudiced me quite heavily against yeah. it. I mean, I know these things can't be helped. There's, there's a, lot, a lot of times things that are of the time feel right just because they're contemporary. 
Um, but that's that's where you have to be careful of what you're doing at the time and try and step outside of fashion and you know and what the latest kit is in the studio. Yeah, so that was my 15 minute rant against yeah, Mark well, Isham. Yeah, and it seems like we've kind of pinpointed where where your sort of antipathy comes from. I did really like the um, production design, the locations. I thought the locations were great. Yeah, and yeah, it looks great. It's um, it's a, a three sided facade. The um, the chateau. It's You're joking. Real. No, they they built that. It's um, they were supposed to shoot, I think, somewhere in Eastern Europe, like Yugoslavia or something, and they couldn't guarantee the weather, so they shot in Utah yeah. during the um, the coldest winter of ninety one, I guess. Um, some of the crew got hypothermia. You know, it's pretty. That uh, tough, does tough conditions. It does translate on screen. You, you get a strong sense from the very beginning of how how cold and uncomfortable and unpleasant it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine being at war, and then imagine being at war in the ice. It's like, oh no, I'd rather not. And every it's... time they they go out to do night duty, you just uh, I don't know. You just feel like the mother going, "Are you wearing enough layers? Are you are you really co- yeah. cover your face up a bit more?" No, you don't. know that kind of cold that gets into your bones. Yes. Yeah doing that for hours on end so it's really really good i mean i didn't should have watched the extras on the disc really i had no idea that was a facade that was terrific yeah and the um the german um hut as well is another purpose-built set and then they shot the interiors at a local school gymnasium so the um the attic was shot on the school stage and then um all the chateau interiors were shot on the yeah on the, on the gym floor basically that's fantastic work Mm, yeah, I think he worked on Mean Streets and Taxi Driver, the uh, the production designer. He died this year. It's the late David Nichols. Uh, yeah, Mean Streets, Art Department, Rocky, Groundhog Day, Taxi Driver, Testament. That was a lovely film. Um, Serpent and the Rainbow. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pro work for a low budget movie. Yeah, I think Keith Gordon was saying that, you know, he was always like, Please, just a little bit more money, a little bit more money for this, a little bit more money for that. And I think, you know, where the for me, where the film is kind of lacking is, um, you know, there's the set pieces. They flee the chateau and the German army comes down the hill and you see all the vehicles and it looks really good. And then they start firing and you just get these kind of really kind of weak A-team level explosions where they just sort of puff in the background <laughs> and just, you know, you don't feel the... The, the threat and the terror of kind of heavy artillery raining down you know that for me that's it that's a shame that they didn't have the budget for that mm. you do have the constant threat in the background the story of this massive kind of german offensive coming towards them oh yes yeah, the battle of the bulge isn't it it's like the huge it's the kind of first proper major engagement for the americans like solo in the second world war mm. I, th- I thought sound design or something could have done more in the background throughout the film to suggest that there's, yeah, yeah. there's stuff going on just over the horizon. One thing I really loved was the this basic idea that you have two groups of soldiers on opposing sides in a war who are a battle weary and just kind of want an end to it. And, you know, Christmas is a great kind of catalyst for passion and just taking a moment to consider the year and, you know, the year ahead and what you want to achieve and, you know, to not kill other people and to just kind of find some peace you know peace on earth and goodwill to all men and i I love the fact that you have these kind of german soldiers retreating from russia who meet these kind of young americans out of their depth and there's just that moment where they're like look it's christmas you know here's some nice uh, german sausage and some schnapps you know and then they exchange gifts and they put a christmas tree up and one of them puts a grenade on the tree and there is kind of these kind of gestures of you know humanity and i think you get them when they're all in the room together looking at each other all these kind of men you know knowing that at any point they could be forced to kill each other and yet just wanting to carry on living you know get home to families and just you know put an end to this nonsense i think yeah i, I really loved that central premise yeah I'm, I'm on the fence because i i was kind of quite moved by the scenes but i felt again that i I could have been more moved, wonderful sentiments, but not quite effective enough. And I think I think this is an important point. It's not something I'm going to lean too heavily on from this point on, but I think you can't give a movie a break because because of its message. You know, a movie isn't its message; it's how it tells the story. Otherwise, you know, you could you could laud any number of 
bad movies about strong, important subjects. It's it's an important moving theme, but I wasn't moved quite as much as I thought I should be. I thought there was things not quite getting there and things getting in the way. As soon as this was set up, I knew that there was a tragedy in the offing. I knew that this couldn't work out and it it felt a little bit clockwork by the time we reached the point where it all kind of goes horribly wrong. Yeah, well, yeah, I think you're expecting it to go pear-shaped, but not to the kind of catastrophic scale that it mm. that it happens, you know. I guess in a lot of films would be the climax, but what I really loved about this film, and, you know, I feel like maybe I'm lean, leaning too heavily the other way, um, but I loved after that was all done and dusted that the team are told to hold their position and they have the dead body of their fallen comrade with them. And while they're waiting, you know, they bathe their dead comrade and clean his body and, you know, get him prepared for kind of the funeral arrangements. And I don't know, I just love that it, it slowed down and you have this kind of, it's almost, you know, an intimate moment with these men and that they're all just in their kind of underwear, having all washed themselves as well. I don't know, there's just something really kind of holy about it. They just, that I found more moving than the... um the surrender and the and the unfortunate killing of all the Germans. To me, it felt, again, theatrical is the word that I'm using, but perhaps contrived is something else, theatrical or literary. See, I, li I like film not, not necessarily to feel like, you know, a series of plot contrivances and, and calculated scenes put together to manipulate you. I mean, that can work really well if it's done well, but sometimes when it's when it feels too obvious it can kind of put me off and it felt a little bit like that i've got another note about the scene it's just the way the scene's handled where they where they first get to the chateau and find the paintings in the loft um oh, and there's, yeah, that... there's all kind of all of the mechanisms start to grind into motion for that scene you kind of get the this kind of rapturous hushed performances the close-up of sinise um and the the kind of ah ah music and then you know it's it's filmmaking mechanism saying there's a message in this scene yeah yeah that it... was a little bit tv movie for me that one i was just like oh that's a bit kind of on the nose especially when they're dancing in the attic i was like oh really spontaneous singing and dancing how do you feel about the slightly odd flashback to off duty life the one flashback early on uh, i liked it again i liked the sort of the intimacy of it i liked that it was a kind of you know, it started off as this sort of bolshy, you know, lads in uniform on the town, going to pick up some girls, and in the end turns into a kind of a very sort of tender, sad scene. It bookends nicely with the scene where they're uh, washing father's body. You know, I like that sort of tender intimacy. It's just not something you see a group of men on film doing, you know, just being kind of vulnerable. Again moments like that i i wasn't so keen on the washing on the oddly homoerotic washing of father's body i guess i'm i'm basically i'm watching the wrong movie aren't i <laughs> yeah. um i want something yeah. that's kind of I've cold stitched... cold and naturalistic and and sharp and direct and i've got something that isn't that <laughs> yeah and you want to make sure the characters are well defined and distinctive yes. but not cliches you're, you're a very hard man to please <laughs> with your anti-war war films the um oh, the scene with the girl who uh you know I'm going to make it sound really bawdy but who has sex with all four of them in the hotel room that character Janice was um played by uh, Keith Gordon's girlfriend at the time okay and he, on the commentary he says it's it was like 10% erotic and 90% maddening <laughs> <laughs> and the, he didn't he didn't know why he'd made that decision but she was up for it and then he, he was like really angry all, all the way through the filmmaking but a little bit turned on at the same time and i loved all that stuff in the third act when the germans have chased them down and their commanding officer john c mcginley has nicked the, the snow chains off their their jeep and the jeep that they're in crashes and then they run out of fuel because they've been abandoned by the american army and in the end they just decide to bury all their weapons use the blood of their um their comrade to mark themselves up as red cross and then they just march all the way back carrying his body you know across the, the 
the enemy lines and the battlefields and the stuff that's on the um, uh, supplementary features on the Blu-ray. There's a, a much more extended sequence of them marching, and I think again that it's slightly frustrating that they don't have the um, the budget to really emphasize the scale of destruction and the inhumanity of war and the kind of bodies and shrapnel and destruction everything that you would expect them to be clawing their way through with this body you know it does feel like they go for a walk in the countryside um with like one burning jeep in the background um but i still think you get this kind of you know the weight you know of carrying your friend home and apparently that all happened. That was all like Wharton's. You know, the only reason he had to um, issue it as a novel instead of a, an autobiography is that they couldn't get hold of the other soldiers to corroborate the uh, authenticity of the story. So it was released as a novel. Mm. How do you think the film um, deals with? I don't know it does. It does present the American army as as particularly callous, not just in the in the almost caricatured. Major Griffin, who's who's almost black comedy whenever he turns up, isn't he? He always manages to find a way to. I I like the fact that um, when he turns up at the chateau about three quarters of the way through, you cut to him and he's already found a very ornate carved chair that he sits in as if it were a yeah. throne. Um, yeah, uh, there's this sort of throwaway line early in the beginning where they talk about him running a funeral home back in the U.S. Mm. and now he's kind of getting busy um, supplying his army counterparts with plenty of business there's you know there's, there's nothing to make going back to camp or going back to the army seem like anything you want to get back to the camp itself is filthy and cold and you're sleeping on the floor your yeah. meals are constantly interrupted um the major's a, a prick um they'll abandon you at a moment's notice and there's they in that sort of hideous touch where they kind of hammer the dog tugs into the jaw of the of the i know cadavers. I that's, that's really grim you know the sense of cold and, and dirt and grime and callousness just makes it feel like the the worst organization in the world <laughs> yeah, sure, and it sure. kind of makes their their terrifying reconnaissance mission seem you know like a bit of an oasis a kind of firelit oasis yeah yeah well, they can it's sure you might get blown up by the germans but at least you're not here <laughs> yeah i mean i you know i don't want to like get into a uh, a long comparison between the um the british and american military but you know there are distinct differences in kind of levels of professionalism and also like engagement i've seen a few documentaries about afghanistan and you, you see the americans generally go in in like full armor sunglasses headphones in completely disengaged from uh, you know the the people whose countries that they're occupying mm -hmm. whereas i think the sort of code of conduct for the brits is as quickly as possible to gain the trust switch from heavy armor into berets and kind of a more softer look and to not be a threatening occupying force and to be seen as something and i think that you know the americans are quite gung-ho and i think they enjoy deploying heavy artillery and spending that money and yeah being being a, a monolithic force rather than a human one I, I am going to sort of skim through. I feel like I need to make amends for a lot of the negativity. I'm going to skim through my notes and flag up all the things that I did really enjoy. Um, I like put that at the beginning. Then you can just <laughs> just cut cut it all in at the front. No, this is this is like a, a a third act redemption. I like I like the way that the Germans make fun of them and um, go out of their way to befriend them in a silly way. I like the fact yeah, that the teasing is really nice. It's isn't really it? funny. And, and for me, there was one little detail which I was just like, wow, that's a really nice distinction that you don't often get again in American movies, especially where the Americans are like, you know, talking to them and saying, you know, the thing with the Nazis. And they're like, whoa, whoa we're not Nazis. We're the German army, <laughs> you know, like making a really important distinction, mm. which I think, for you know, in modern films is just all rolled into oh, one God, easy no, caricature. Isn't it? Since the Second World War, there's, there's no distinction there you, for the sake of for the sake of simplification. All Germans yeah. were Nazis. Yeah, I liked uh, the fact that when they got again, I can't remember which two characters it were. But when they first come face to face with two of the Germans in a forest clearing or, oh, yeah. or on, out in the snow, they immediately panic and surrender. There's yeah, no yeah. combat situation. It's just like they have no idea what to do. They put their hands up. They're, you know, just give up immediately. Yeah, yeah. They're screaming at each <laughs> other, aren't they? But the Germans just disappear. They're like, oh, no, we're not, we're not here to kill you. 
the Christmas exchanging of gifts. I mean, I know I've said that it's, it's it, it is teetering on being a hackneyed movie moment, despite how beautiful the message is mm. and the reality of it. But I did. It, it was quite moving by the end of the scene. Yeah, yeah. What about the snowball sequence? That really made me laugh. <laughs> I think it's grenade at first, don't they? I, I always remember um, Pauline Kale's review of Colours, where she gives away in the review, she gives away the fact that Robert Duvall's character dies at the end, and then she oh, puts, yeah. you know, if you think that's a spoiler, you've clearly never seen a movie before. <laughs> I, I I was sort of in that frame of mind when you know the the stage surrender was going on. Um, I knew that it was going to go badly wrong, but the literally the shot in which it goes wrong when suddenly one of the Germans is shot in the chest is really, really powerful. Yeah. Um, it's good stuff. It's, it's, the, you think they're just on the verge and it, it does play out pretty well. You think they're just on the verge of it and you can imagine the rest of the film moving forward in a surprising direction with trying yeah. to get them back to the base and trying to, you know, possibly trying to spare their lives and have them kept alive as prisoners. But no, it, when it does go wrong, it's, it's a very, very powerful shot. Just that, you know, that, one bullet to the chest and then everything kind of goes to chaos. Yeah, it falls apart really quickly. Yeah, yeah. And it's over in a few seconds, isn't it? You know, yeah, exactly. Germans dead, a couple of them are wounded, and yeah, that's it. My only other notes were just on the film's box office, an anecdote from Keith Gordon. He was kind of heartbroken. They'd spent the entire marketing budget leading up to the opening weekend, and it was the weekend of the Rodney King riots. Basically, all the cinemas were shut down on Friday mm. afternoon, and it just killed its opening weekend. It, you know, I think it opened in one theater for a, one showing at like midday and made seventy dollars, and then basically it was done. I mean, if if there's anything that you had to lose your opening weekend to, there's kind of that and nine eleven. You'd have to just kind of shrug and say, yeah, "Fair yeah. enough," but yeah, 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 I can imagine after putting that much work in. And then I think he was saying that it's had a kind of slow life on. DVD and more in Europe than in the States. And it's good, you know, it was his first movie. It's good that he's still working and doing good. And he is good. He's he's His TV episodes are standouts. We've just finished watching The Leftovers. They did a few episodes for. And, oh, yeah, okay. you know, one of the ones that he did was really good. It was outstanding. And he did quite a few episodes of seasons two and three of Fargo, which were, which were excellent yeah, shows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I've, you know, I feel really bad at the end of this, having s slagged off his first movie, and just killed any imaginary goodwill between us in the process. <laughs> but I still really like him. I think he's, I think he's really good. Yeah, I think he, I think he's really, really decent. And I thought this, you know, had some really kind of nice sort of, I want to say, film school technique. You know, where you're just kind of trying things with the camera. I liked the the opening sequence with Sinise screaming into the the kind of white voids and just using the same tracking shot two or three times to emphasize that. You know, I, I liked all, all those kind of, yeah, film school technique. Should we do a quick wrap up? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. So, um, I've obviously I've made my feelings unfortunately clear. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a very strong... I would be tempted to read the novel now, which is the second time that Keith Gordon's done that to me. I would strongly recommend Mother Night, his his subsequent Second World War film, based on the Kurt Vonnegut oh, yeah. novel. It's a... It's... Yeah, it's a really... Obviously, it's Vonnegut, so it's strange and surprising um, and pulls the rug out from under you a few times, but it's a very, very good exploration of personal honour and un, unacknowledged sacrifice, shall we say? I would recommend that very strongly. I, I, yeah. I mean, I've made my feelings clear, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna step back and say Merry <laughs> Christmas and leave it to Shane to, to be a bit more Christmassy and upbeat than me. Yeah, I think at the right age, this film would make the right impression, and and that is just simply the war is a, a kind of waste of human life, and you know the it, the sacrifice that's made by the men on the ground, you know, is. It's it's heartbreaking and and you know can be avoided and you know we shouldn't be trusting the people in power with the lives of our our, our teenagers. I do think the message is there and yeah if you if you catch somebody at the right age or the right point in their life I think this could do the job and get the message across. Um, I again I'm very very wary of confusing the message of a film with the actual the actual quality of the film itself. 
Yeah, but and for that's... me, like I said at the beginning, this this film is greater than the sum of its parts. You know, I think if I take the performances in general, I like them. I like the look of it. I like the tone. Um, you know, I think it's lacking a little bit of aesthetic and um, budgetary scale, which I think, you know, comes across. But what I'm trying to say is when you're young, you don't see all of those kind of faults. You know, you are just directly engaged with the message. And I think, sure, it's it's hammered home, but it's a, it's a message that needs to be 